Awesome. My name's Yannick. Um, I'm going to distract you for a few minutes. I work with ants. Um, people often ask me, do I work with the red ants or the black ants? Um, there's not just red and black ants. There's orange <laughs> ones and green ones and shiny ones and some with big heads and some that look like weapons and some that look like aliens. Among the 20,000 species of ants, there's a huge diversity. What they have in common is that 150 million years ago, they evolved an obligate social lifestyle where the queens and the workers reproduce, uh, sorry, the queens and the males reproduce, and the workers build the nest, defend the nest, forage for food. Just as there's a huge amount of diversity in their morphologies, there's just as much diversity in how their societies are organized. And um, YouTube is popular these days. Um, uh, okay, so if you're in the Americas, you'll, you'll see, you might see a bunch of ants. They're carrying leaves um, back into their nest, and they won't eat the leaves directly because trees put poison into the leaves, they don't want to have them to, to be eaten. Instead, the ants grow this white stuff, it's a fungus. Um, they grow that on the leaves, and the, that transforms the leaf into something edible, it's a type of bread. The ants eat exclusively that fungus, um, the fungus does not exist without the ant. It's an obligate form of agriculture that's existed for 20 million years. Um, here, some people poured some cement. Each one of these kind of football-sized things is one chamber. If it gets contaminated with a different fungus, they will eliminate access to it so it doesn't contaminate, etc. Um, a different way some ants work with uh, leaves is found in these Southeast Asian ants. Um, they pull together the leaves and then, you know how some insects make a cocoon to protect themselves during metamorphosis before becoming an adult? Well, here instead, the, larva, the silk produced by the larva is used to stick the leaves together. Um, and you end up with these kind of aerial chambers here, they're still building it. Here they're done. A colony will have a dozen or so of such chambers um, being protected up in the air. Crossing the pond again to Brazil, here's the entrance of a different species of ant. These guys, every evening they close it, and it's like a handful of, ant, of workers that stay outside. Here on the right is an accelerated the 30 minutes before dusk. So initially you can see the, where the entrance was, and by the time they're done, it's all smooth. So you see smooth sand, but not where the entrance was. Um, those guys head off into different directions, and they're going to die during the night. We interpret that they're doing this to protect their sisters um, from predators. And to my knowledge, it's the only example of preventative self-sacrifice outside of humans. Why so much effort to live up in the trees or to hide the entrance of the nest? The biggest threat to an ant colony is a different type of ant. These army ants or driver ants where you have hundreds of thousands or even millions of individuals that are constantly on the move. And if they find the entrance to a social insect colony, they will go inside and have a feast. Over the past few hundred years, and longer still, um, people have documented tons of stuff about the behavior of these different species, their morphologies, the types of contexts where there are advantages to social life. In contrast, we have known almost nothing about how, at a genetic level, you know, how does DNA, the information inside DNA, how does that regulate how these societies are organized? How does a female egg, you know, develop, by, by which genetic mechanisms is determined whether a female egg will, deter, will become a queen and live up to 30 years, or become a worker that dies after a few months? And for a long time it was impossible to look at such questions. This graph, uh, no, no pointer. Okay, Moore's Law is the rate at which, you know, computers get faster every year. And the cost of DNA sequencing was going down at that same rate. 2007, 2008, there was a huge technological disruption. This is a log scale, meaning that today it's 50,000 times cheaper than 10 years ago to generate DNA sequence data. A project, a master's project that cost a thousand bucks, the equivalent data 10 years ago would have cost 50 million to generate. It is completely changing biology and basically has thrust it into the world of big data. I like to argue that it's harder for us in biology than in some other sciences, um, in, in part because um, this change has come up so suddenly, meaning basically anyone older than me um, has never had to wrangle a big data set. 
Um, but even our, our understanding is very superficial. We think of DNA as a linear string, a linear list of A's, C's, G's, and T's. We know that you know, that doesn't work. It's, in, it's wrapped up in 3D inside cells. The fact that the field is so young um, means that a lot of the data types that we have to deal with and the tools that we use, they keep changing. I, sh I showed you the... Um, in 2007-2008, in this huge disruption was a new technology. That company, um, basically by here, uh, it didn't exist anymore. And the um, software to analyze the raw data that it generated um, was closed source, inaccessible, you know, kind of dead. Um, really, really challenging. Um, I'd like to briefly share a few thoughts from, from some of what I've um, seen here. Um, I, I think this world of genome biology is ideal for fair and open practices. Um, first of all, to increase the ability to answer specific questions um, and, and the efficiency of doing that. But also because these days a lot of people, you know, because now sequencing is so cheap, they generate this huge amount of data to answer one specific question and they don't look at all the other 99% of questions that could be answered with that data. Um, we are lucky in that the Human Genome Project, which cost $3 billion in 2001, um, that led to the creation of a standard place for our most standard data types and, and some metadata, metadata descriptor necessities, etc. Um, other data that's generated since then has often gone into that same repository. Here it's been quite useful for me. I started my lab here six and a half years ago. Um, basically, my first three PhD students didn't generate any new data. We just performed different analysis on existing data that we could access um, through, through those, that central database. Um, and access to these you know, published data sets um, underlies basically everything we do, although we generate a lot of our own as well. I was a computer scientist type person before I got into this ant stuff. Um, and, and so I guess I was, well, I, 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 I see the value of um, open practices. Um, and I've seen that at several levels, that kind of philosophy has helped me and my lab um, within the broad community. So it's created visibility for the tools that we make, it's led to citations for people citing us, not for the biological question that we're um, answering, but for how we did it or some of the peripheral data. And um, th this one is interesting recently um, because um, I guess PhD students sometimes when they're considering which supervisor to go for, they, they stalk them online. Um, and, uh, and if, you know, I guess younger people have the tendency to be more idealist in their approaches and, and the impacts that they want to have. And so it's helped us for that too. Um, I'll give a brief example of, of <coughs> well, when we started generating ant genomes, this was around, yeah, the disruption point, 2008 or 2009, um, I suddenly got, became super popular because I was one of the few people who knew how to analyze data, essentially rapidly became annoying because lots of people were asking me to do this analysis and that analysis. We created a small interface to make it easier for people to search sequence data themselves. Um, and that was initially just to stop being annoyed by people asking us. Um, but we put it online on GitHub and, and it's been quite successful because it's used in, in, in many places worldwide. And that's you know, an example of, of what's helped my visibility, my lab's visibility in the broader community we work in. Um, but there have been some costs, too, in that there's, you know, a handful, maybe two hands full of labs doing very, very similar things to what we do. Um, well, if we're sharing our data and describing it well, and sharing our code and describing that well, well, we're essentially giving them, you know, our resources for free. Um, the other level is that, well, because... There's a potential for collaboration in many contexts, but if you give everything away, or rather the people feel that they can just copy-paste what you've done, and they don't understand that 
for different data sets, you need to modulate things. Um, th th that can eliminate collaboration opportunities. To summarize, um, I, I'm struggling more today than I did a few years ago about fair and open approaches. Um, and, and I think the reason for that is that there's no good mechanism in place to ensure reciprocity. Um, and, and maybe there's a part of generational divide as well. Um, I, 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 I